Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, I uh, am very glad to be with you. I was there in 2019, learned a lot from um, many that are still here today, uh, and um, um, particularly from uh, Dr. Ying Zhang with his uh, in vitro studies with uh, anti uh, combination antibiotics for Lyme disease. So let me now present what uh, we have been doing in my clinic and uh, the impact on um, Lyme patients with persistent symptoms or uh, otherwise defined uh, um, complications of Lyme disease like PTLDS, chronic Lyme disease, uh, whatever we call them. But before I wanna especially thank uh, Professor Wade Lloyd because she's with us and also Christian Perron, Perron and uh, my own uh, companion in life and colleague of uh, um, epidemiologist who has uh, done the analysis on our data. So um, I'm here because as uh, many of you, I've uh, had the experience of uh, people coming to my clinic with chronic symptoms after uh, a clinical syndrome perfectly consistent with uh, the evolution of Lyme uh, symptoms and Lyme disease, but which are excluded from care and treatment because of uh, the many instances where the serology is not there, uh, a serology based, and we have to repeat it, and I take care to repeat it in every of my presentations, which are based uh, on criteria set for epidemiological rather than clinical purposes, which unfortunately until when I learned about it through, uh, through my political work, even as an infectious disease uh, doctor, and it's the case with a lot of my colleagues, uh, was just uh, had, had escaped my attention. So this is an important issue. Now, um, Lyme disease is uh, emerging and uh, soon to be probably uh, the epicenter in uh, our continent. Why? Because uh, we are just bordering uh, three states in the United States, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, which uh, in the past 10 years have been um, the epicenter of the disease with the highest uh, incidence rates of Lyme disease uh, in the world, only equal or surpassed by four other territories in Europe. And as we all know, climate change pushes the, um, um, the tick habitat uh, to north. And as you see, if we, we just look at the, um, from a one health uh, standpoint, one health uh, approach uh, to the problem, as you see in this, uh, in this forecast of Lyme disease for, um, for companion uh, animals, this is the incidence of Lyme in dogs and it's uh, in, neighboring region of Quebec and part of Quebec, dogs are, are showing already uh, incident rates of higher than 10%. I'm, I just wanna come back to say that all in Southern Quebec and also in Nova Scotia, we have, um, we have incident rates already uh, nearing the incident rates of our Southern states or almost. So the objectives of, uh, of uh, my work uh, has to keep track of the evolution of patients that I began to treat, treat just on, a, on an individual basis, on a clinical basis, without any intention in the beginning to, uh, to um, uh, study them. Um, but then we decided to keep track uh, for these patients who have, have had received a long-term antibiotic to install a register of these patients follow their symptoms with appropriate tools. Uh, I will show how we have divided them for our analysis between proven, probable, and what we call possible, but in my opinion, we must probably call it plausible and highly suspected cases of Lyme disease that uh, for which we have instituted combination therapy, uh, much along this, uh, the, the, um, uh, the ideas of uh, uh, of those who have treated these patients for many decades in US and uh, supported by the work of uh, Ying Zhang and other colleagues in the recent years. And uh, we had two main clinical questions. What's the impact of these long-term treatments on the burden of the disease in terms of quality of life, functional improvement? And on the other hand, what is the, um, 
the main objection sometimes or uh, um, uh, problem uh, for a lot of my colleagues, uh, will it really do much harm, uh, plausibly impacting the patient's uh, outcome or not? Uh, I will skip the methods. Um, well, just to say that it's not observational study, there was no uh, um, arm of a uh, control arm with placebo, as you, you might uh, well uh, understand. Um, and the characteristic of my clinic is that it's the first one specialized, which is hospital based within the public health system. And we essentially included all uh, patients who consulted the, the clinic. Now, our definitions, be clear about uh, what um, we're dealing with. Um, for the purpose of um, our approach, uh, and uh, as a, I would say, as a um, um, pragmatic uh, operational definition of what would be a proven clinical Lyme disease, for us, any ELISA positive patients, regardless of the Western blood, who would have uh, erythema migrans or a compatible syndrome with strong epidemiological evidence would be considered proven clinical Lyme disease. The rationale behind that is that um, having an erythema migrans or having a strong epi epidemiological, epidemiological evidence in a patient which has the compatible clinical syndrome is a high pretest probability which um, confers to the ELISA a high um, positive predictive value. So in our view, in that context, uh, ELISA positive uh, test was proving in our uh, view the uh, chronic Lyme disease. Now for ELISA negative patients, if they had erythema migrans or an observed, observed tick, one of these two, with compatible clinical syndrome again and convincing epidemiological evidence, well, that would be a probable chronic Lyme. And we would consider Lyme as to be possible or plausible, even if the ELISA was negative and there was no erythema migrant, no recollection of tick bite, but a very consistent clinical syndrome in terms of how it appeared, where it appeared in terms of epidemiology, the context and the evolution through time, we would consider it as possible clinical Lyme, uh, chronic Lyme disease if other um, um, work, the workup had shown that other plausible diagnosis through different, um, different evaluations by us or by other specialists had excluded those possibilities. So let me describe you the, uh, the court of our patients. Uh, in the 468 patients that we, uh, for which we have analyzed the data, 17% had no or another tick-borne uh, infection. Um, based on our definition, 12% had proven clinical Lyme disease. Um, almost 50% had probable clinical Lyme disease. And there was a quarter of our patients which based on epidemiological context and um, evolution of their symptoms, the clinical syndrome compatible with Lyme disease would be considered possible chronic Lyme disease. So these patients, these three categories were eligible for the treatment according to our model. That's almost 400 patients among our cohort. So just to describe a little bit the characteristic of my cohort, 67%, um, more than two thirds were female, the median age were for, was 47, but spanning really through uh, a, a big span of, of ages. And um, uh, at least 17% um, of patients had another person in, in the family who had had or had already had problems with Lyme. Uh, the burden of the disease, as uh, a lot of other participants have uh, um, have described is really very heavy in, in our patients. Uh, almost 40% were on sick leave or completely invalid. 8% um, of the, our patients have, have had had suicidal attempts. Many had attempted, we have had in the last five years, five patients, six patients, I'm sorry, who have committed suicide and one who has obtained medical aid for dying. Um, so this is uh, the situation. 
Now, uh, as another, in my opinion, burden of the disease is the extent of the utilization of the health system. It's a problem for the health system, but it's a problem. This wandering around is a problem for patients themselves. Uh, they, um, uh, on average, uh, my patients had consulted more than three doctors, almost four doctors before ending up, most of them specialists in neurology and rheumatology. Many of them had sought uh, care outside of Quebec with considerable cost, and many had also for with, with considerable cost. Yeah. Can, can, can you accelerate a little bit? Because, yes, uh, know, Christian, I will do that. Uh, based on Horowitz's uh, score, 80% uh, of my patients would, would uh, qualify for chronic Lyme. Now, uh, as um, you might expect, the first line of choice for treatment were, was doxycycline, azithromycin, and Refampin with other drugs, depending on the consequence of their treatment and side effects. But as you see, 80% uh, of the patients had more than three months, but most importantly, more than half of the patients had more than one year of treatment with combination therapy. Now let's see the results. As you see, uh, only less than 10% of the patients in all groups uh, had a negative impact. Negative impact, in uh, involving deterioration or important side effects. But uh, almost 20% uh, of the patients had a functional improvement and diminish, dim, dim, uh, decrease in the burden of the disease of almost 20%. And two thirds of the patients showed based on, um, on standard, uh, um, standard um, uh, questionnaire, uh, an improvement of more than 55%. So the response to antibiotic was positive, not statistically different between different categories of uh, proven, probable, or possible. Uh, and most importantly, almost a third of those who were sick on sick leave or were invalid were back to work after antibiotic therapy. So I think we can conclude by saying that this uh, long-term antibiotics clinically improved treatment outcomes. They, they show um, significant effectiveness, um, despite uh, that many received without positive two-tier uh, Lyme serological testing. But of course, more studies are warranted because there are many, many limits, many biases in the way uh, my study is designed um, that I can answer if questions are uh, intended. Thank you very much, uh, all of you.